read your Bible. But it says that the day is coming, the day is approaching, right? But here's the other thing it says, but exhorting, I'm doing it backwards, one another as so much the more as you see the day coming. What does exhorting mean? No, not gathering together. Lifting up, okay, I got you. Anybody else got a word? They said, got, they said exhorting means to lift up. Anybody else? Show love, yep. Exhorting, strongly encouraging and urging someone to do something. Strongly encouraging and urging someone to do something. When we come together, we don't come together just to look at each other and smile. We should be encouraging and urging one another to live a life that will be pleasing unto God. To do what God has placed us here to do. Because, listen, if time is short, you're, okay, let me put it this way. If we see the day approaching, right? We recognize the signs. The day is approaching. Rumors of wars, all this stuff. We, the day is approaching. We agree. Time is getting short. When you're on your job and it's about time to go home, but you know you can't go home because your boss is going to come in and look and say, is your project done? Now, you got your part done. But Becky over here, who is a team member, right? We're talking about team. She's a team member. She ain't got hers done. What do you do? Okay, so you, you begin to help her, right? Is it worth dogging her out? Girl, you know you should have had that done. Uh, it, it, uh, what's, what's gonna, she going to end up shutting down on you. But if you urge her, come on, I got you. I, I'm, I'm in this with you. Uh, when we come to church, it should be that same attitude. That's why the Bible says, mourn with them that mourn and rejoice with them that rejoice. That means, listen, however, whatever state you see your brother and sister in, you should be trying to make it better by encouraging or exhorting them, lifting them up from their place of, of, of desolate, from their place of pain, from their place of trouble. And sometimes we don't do a good job of being stewards of our own brothers and sisters. We take care of everyone else, but the Bible says do good of them, especially of those of the household of faith. We have to do better at encouraging or exhorting our brothers and sisters. It's nothing wrong with telling somebody they did a good job. So I'm working this backwards, right? But then it says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. Some people don't care about getting together. I can do it on my own. I said, no. It's a bad situation when you feel like you can run this race on your own. You can't. Yeah, that, that I'm just going to be very honest with you. It, I think it's personally impossible for you to run this race on your own. Even Jesus had 12 disciples, and one of them betrayed him. Even when Jesus went off to the, to the uh, woods to pray, he still brought around his inner circle and said, just come with me. He get, God never intended for you to make this journey by yourself. He intended for us to come together as a family, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves, right? So what I got out of that is don't take it for granted, right? And then when you come together, you must be purposeful and you have to have a desire. Family reunions. Why do we go to family reunions? 
to see the family you ain't seen. What else happens at family reunion? I can't hear you. You get all the news. What else? Huh? You eat a lot. Let's talk about the, uh, let's, let's go to the relationship part of it. What happens to those relationships? You reconnect, right? What if you find out that somebody uh, that was there last time ain't there this time? How does the, how do, how do, how do you respond or how does the family respond? See, a lot of times uh, in my family reunion, we would sit up there and they have a moment of silence in order to hear or to reflect on who was once present but is not. And at, during that moment of silence, people can then remember what that person contributed to the body or to the family. How can we come to church and say that we're here for God and we're here for our brothers and sisters, but we take it for granted? You show up when you want to show up. Let that family reunion fish fry don't start on time. And you out in that park and the heat going. Now everybody upset. But yet you'll come to church. You're supposed to start at 1030. And instead we'll start at 1035. Why? Well, I was waiting on such and such. No. Don't take it for granted while you're here. You know what to do. Step up to the plate and do it. Be purposeful when you come in. If you know you have an assignment, don't wait for somebody else to do your assignment. And then you have to have a desire. When you have a desire to go to your family reunion, I don't care if it's in Memphis. I done seen folk ride the bus to the family because they just strongly, they had to be there. When was the last time you just had to be at church? Nobody called you or sent you a text. You just knew you, I, I got to get there. It's my job. I got to be there. There's something in the house I got to get. There's a word I got to receive. You have a strong desire to get there. And no matter what the devil threw your way, you got there. Think about tonight. How many of you had somewhere else you'd rather be? I guess I'm the only one. Right, right. But when I started to think about what tonight is, I said, okay, if I don't go to Bible study, man, ain't nobody else prepared to teach. So ain't nobody going to get taught nothing. I've neglected my responsibility. I neglected the saints. Uh, I told God that if he wanted me to do this, I'd do this, so I lost my purpose. Right? Uh, so what happens is my very absence creates a chaos in the house. Because I, I, I did not, uh, I was not purposeful in my attendance, in my responsibility. So let's read it forward now. Here's the other part I like too. So when I, when I don't forsake coming together because I know there's a purpose, watch here's the purpose. You ready? Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. My church membership, my very presence, when I come in, I should be giving off love. Why am I giving off love? Because I want to stir up somebody to do good works. I'm going to be an example for somebody of good works. When I do it, I'm going to smile about what I'm doing because I realize I'm stirring up, I'm urging, I'm pushing somebody else to do just a little bit better. My smile may make somebody else smile. That hug that I give may embrace somebody to the point where they feel like, man, I felt like giving up coming up in here. But what if God had assigned one person to you on your Wednesday? 
And because you didn't push through, you didn't show up. Let me put it like this. Let me, let me throw this out here. Uh, sometimes in a hotel, they will have people that are assigned to certain rooms, right? Uh, if the room ain't clean, they can't rent it out, right? If you assign to a room, but you didn't do your job in showing up, cleaning it, and preparing it, then the person that walks into that very room that you was assigned to you walks into a dirty room. Them walking into a dirty room, they're not going to say, I had a dirty room. It was a dirty hotel. Right? Now they get on Yelp and they give you your rating. They don't say that the room that I had and the person that was supposed to clean the room left the room dirty. They say the hotel is dirty. Now, all the other rooms could have been clean. But that one room left the impression on somebody. When we don't take care of the local church, people then transcribe what happened to them in the local church to the universal church. You've heard a church hurt? One person hurt them. One person said something to them. One thing didn't go their way. Then the next thing you hear is, I got church hurt. Well, where was you at? You didn't tell them it was just Tina that said it. You've transcribed it to the church, not just local, but the church universal. So just like that, listen, if bad news goes the same, so does good news. The Bible in the New Testament is written uh, to churches, right? Then it's written to certain people. That's why you got the book of Timothy. You, 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 got, th you got those kind of books, Philemon, they're written to certain people. That's local. But do you know that there always is a universal message, which is why me and you can read it and still see ourselves today? We have to think about our church membership the same way. It is just not how you represent First Salem, but it's how you represent the church, the body of Christ. So it is important for us to come together for orientation. When you get ready to get a job, the first thing they do, I don't care how much information you got, how much experience you have, they say come to orientation. Well, I got to come to orientation. We just want to show you how we do it. We want to show you what we feel like is the right way. So that way when you're out there doing it, you're a, you are a good representation of who we are. We have to get to a point that we don't just want to represent the local church. We want to represent the whole church in a good light. But don't get so caught up in the whole church that you forget you have a local responsibility as well. People that sit there, I'm called to the nations. I want to see what local church you was called to first. Because if you're not doing it at the local level, don't you dare do it on a national stage. Because now all you're doing is saying my gift is only good for the bright light. No, let's, I want to see the small stage person. Because the Bible says that if you're faithful over a few things, He'll make you ruler over many. That means if you could just be faithful in the small thing, in the local church, I'll, do, I'll lift you to the universal church. I'll make things right. Our church membership has to start somewhere. And listen, even before it gets to the local church, you also have to understand it starts in your home. It starts in your home. So we can go granular. It starts in the home. It starts in your kids. It starts in your wife. It starts in, in the Father. It, it, it starts there, and then it lifts and moves. But it says, forsaking not the assembly. We ought to be happy to come together. Every time we get a chance to come together, we ought to be happy because it gives me another chance to check on my brother. It gives me another chance 
to see my sister. It gives me another chance to sit up there and say, I'm struggling and no, they're not going to criticize me, but they're going to come to my rescue because they're going to exhort me, not critique me. When they exhort me, they are pushing me to good works. Girl, you got to come out of that. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh, boy, weeping may endure that. I don't want to hear those scriptures. And listen, I totally agree. Don't be just throwing people scriptures all the time when you're trying to lift them up or you're trying to bury them. You got to have some real life conversations sometimes. You having a pity party. Why you say that? Because that situation was a for a moment. You've expanded it across days now. Let's go back to that moment and deal with it. I'm not neglecting that something happened that was tragic. I'm not neglecting that something happened that was in that time. I'm not neglecting that, but what I'm telling you is don't keep carrying it because, listen, I, you're already proven that the longer you carry it, the worse it's going to get for you. But it says, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Take 30 seconds and give somebody a word of exhortation. Come on, move, do something. Give somebody a word of exhortation. It shouldn't, take, it shouldn't be this hard. It's simple. Urge them to good works. Urge them to smile. Urge them to love. Urge them, push them, love on them. Give you about 10 more seconds. All right. All right, here we go. Here we go. Sister Mills, what word did you receive? You didn't receive a word? Did you give a word? What's the word you gave? Okay. So you told somebody that they are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. All right? You told your daughter that? Okay, great. Uh, Sister Thomas, what was your word? What, what word did you get? Yep. Yeah. Did you receive a word from somebody? Okay. Uh-huh. Okay, when you're down, always look up. Watch me give all of you a word. Yeah, I'm here for you. Let me give you another word. Smile, girl, it's all right. Now watch this. The moment that she smiled, now she's open for the next move. It doesn't take a whole lot, but you have to be purposeful in doing it. When we come in here, why are we purposeful about the seat we want to sit in? We go straight to it. But are you purposeful about showing somebody love? Making sure, before I leave here today, I got to tell somebody, God loves you, and so do I. Before I leave here today, I just want to tell you, girl, let, let's go to Applebee's and let's, let's, let's have the all-you-can-eat platter. Why are we doing that? I just want to hang out with you. I just want you to know, you know, it, 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 it bothers me that we forsake the reason that we come together. Why did you come today? Why are you here? If you're not here, not only to get the word, but for fellowship, you're here for the wrong thing. Because then you came for a word that you could be a loner. Here is the thing about loners. No loner ever won a war by himself. You show me a man that stood up against any and everything by himself and won a war, and I'll, 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 I'll say you win. And don't try and be all, you know what I'm saying, all righteous up in here and say, Jesus! No. 
Because that's some of y'all was getting ready to do it. Jesus did it. No, 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 no. Because watch this. Jesus even said after he left or when he was getting ready to leave, greater works than this shall you do. If the war was over, he wouldn't need you to do nothing. He said, go there and show them the love, the love that I showed to you. You showed to them. That's how they should know they're my, you, you are my disciples. Well, why would he need me if the war was over? Why would he need me to show somebody else some love? That's why he sat up there when people would gather around him and he started talking. He said, I know y'all want to eat. He feed them. And then they start, he started giving them some truth. Next thing you know, they leave. He started feeding again, seemed like everybody show up again. But as soon as he started giving the word, because they did not come together for the right purpose. He met their need, but then he said, listen, the right purpose is I need to give you something that will not let you hunger anymore. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves. Let me also give you something else. Galatians 6. Galatians, the sixth chapter. Let me help you out here. We're still dealing with this coming together as a local church, our responsibilities. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering lest you are tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks of himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work and then he will will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in others. For each one shall bear his own load. Right? When we come together, we come together and sometimes it is the weak that are going to need the strong to undergird them. In the local church, the strong have to be willing to get under the cross of another. Sometimes it does not matter even if you know how to get them out from under it. The point is, I'm going to show you by getting in there with you. Now, he does say, if you weak, don't try this. Look right here in the text. It says, considering yourself lest you be tempted. You can't help nobody if you're dealing with the same struggle. You're dealing with the same struggle, and you ain't came out. Don't you go back trying to help nobody. You, 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 everybody messed up then. If you got on glasses and I got on glasses, and then we both ain't got no glasses, we in trouble. So I can see in both of us squinting. Mm, no. Give me somebody with good vision to pair with somebody with not good vision. And let them guide and strengthen each other. You don't put two weak folk together. But if you've been in here lifting weights, reading your Bible, at some point you ought to have some strength. So therefore you can go and help somebody else. In the local church, The local church gives you some things that the universal church can't. I don't care how many of y'all watch T.D. Jakes. Anybody watch T.D. Jakes on TV? Ooh, look at all them hands. How many of y'all, if y'all walked up on T.D. Jakes, he gonna know your name? I ain't trying to be funny. Right? But in the local church, Made him mad, Lord Jesus. Uh, he must have been asleep. Uh, in the local church, guess what? Y'all remember the y'all remember the TV show Cheers? You know, 
what I remember about Cheers is the whole uh, musical intro uh, where everybody knows your name. Don't you want to go where you can see that your troubles are all the same? Don't you want to go where everybody knows your name? Now, I know that Cheers was a bar. I know that the mailman was going to be sitting on the stool. I'm trying to figure out how you sitting on the stool in your work clothes, 9 a.m. But everybody knew the mailman. So when he was down, everybody knew. The bartender knew. The girl that wasn't supposed to be the bartender with the attitude, the short lady with the red hair, she knew. And everybody made a concerted effort to help the mailman. It should be the same way in the local church when we come together. If you come up in here and somebody is sitting on their stool, you should make a concerted effort to try to make sure they can get what they need to go back to work. Because that's what it happened. He drank his beer. After they got done talking, he said, I got to go back to work. You ought to be, as as a body of Christ in the local church, we should be trying to help each other get back to work. Because it said stirring up each other to good work. If you ain't working, what you doing here? What What are you here for if you're not going to do any work? You know there's a thing called spiritual obesity. You know how you get obese? You keep eating and don't move. Then you get, t- you get TV shows like My Big Fat Greek Wedding. You get TV shows like 600 Pounds of Life or whatever it's called. Because that person has just been eating and eating and eating and not doing anything. You know, in the church, we got some spiritually obese folk. They come to church every Sunday. Come to Bible study every Sunday. Can show you and tell you everything, but won't do nothing with what they see. They're taking up space. That's what the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees were. They were folk, they, they knew it. They were so spiritually unbeast, but when they started to come and put it in practice, they struggled at it because they didn't have love, they didn't have fellowship. We have to do a better job in the local church of having fellowship. It seems to me in this day and age, people find more fellowship in a universal church because first, don't nobody know you. You can say whatever you want. You can pretend to be whoever you want to be. And you can post whatever you want to post. And somebody will be like, you got it right? Somebody will be looking like, where they copy that from? Because it don't line up. With what they've been taught, it doesn't line up. With what they've said, it does So then I had to go to them, Where'd you, what's up? I just saw it and posted it. Well, you might want to watch what you're posting. Because there should be a certain level of accountability and responsibility. God never intended us just to be in the universal church. He wanted us to be in the local church. Because listen, if he, did not, if he only had the universal church, then he did not need to have preachers. What's the use of having a preacher? If you could just be in a universal church, what's the use of having a pastor? What's the use of having sisters and brothers in Christ? What's the use of having fellowship if you're not going to do it at the local level? Before you ever get national, you better be local. Y'all following me? All right. Uh, number nine. Number nine. It says, read the entire story of Jesus rebuking his disciples in Matthew 20. Verses 20 through 28. I know I'm going about this a little different because I want to drive home, home a point tonight about our church membership and even this thing of let me back up. On last night, as we lurched to the local church, there was a word from our DEA study. It was 
Jesus edify, edification. Uh, what did we determine edify meant? To build yourself up? Okay. You can build yourself or you can build others, right? All right. What else we got? Any, anybody else with the word edify? There was a couple of words that I had highlighted. I didn't bring my book uh, that I had. Yeah, thank you. That I had highlighted that I, I gave you as it relates to edification on that, on that uh, worksheet. You got it? Here's the worksheet I gave you last night. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Prepare. this at the local level we should be building each other not tearing each other down now understand this it does not mean if you are get into a situation where you may be wrong that you don't receive correction correction is actually building you because listen if I if you're building a building and you put in the wrong type of uh, uh, metal brace and it's in the wrong area, you could cause a whole building to come down. So we are here to build each other in the right manner because we need to prepare each other for ministry. Right? We need to make sure that we're making ready disciples. And then this other piece is to charge up, right? In sports, they have what we call pep rallies. During a pep rally, whether it's the cheerleaders or there's an MC, whether there's a, b a band, whatever it is, that what their main job is is to create energy inside of the fellowship. Now, here's the thing about the pep rally. The pep rally does not have to take place right next to the game. Or maybe that's just when I was in school. We could have a pep rally during the school hours, but the game did not take place until 6. So there was a time in between the game, the pep rally, right? But I was still charged up from the pep rally. When we come to the local church and we're in service, it is our pep rally to get ready for the game. What's the game? It's the ministry. It's the world. It's all of, we got to get ready to go face all of that and proclaim a gospel that they automatically want to reject. But how are you going to handle rejection if you're not even built up for it? Who's going to teach you how to handle rejection except those that have been rejected? Who's going to sit up there and prepare you? That means give you the tools for. That means that God's saying, listen, I need to edify you. I need to prepare you, give you the tools, give you the skills in order for you to do the ministry that I've set up for you. That happens in the local church. Then you sit there, you say, well, what are we making ready for what? Because according to over in Hebrew, because we see the day approaching. You can't decide. It, it, it is, uh, it, it, it is um, T.D. Jakes to sit up there and say, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. When the Bible say be ready. You ain't got no time to get ready. You got to be ready. It's like when you get ready, uh, and maybe, maybe your mom ain't like this, uh, Kalasia. Uh, but my mom, at a certain point, when she get agitated, uh, she go get in the car, turn on the car, and then she gonna hunk once. If you ain't outside, she leaving. Now the older I get, I find myself doing the same thing. After a while, I be like, "Let's go, y'all." They still be in there pillaring. I go get in the car, I turn on the car, I back the car up. By the time I get ready, I, I'll be ready to hit the horn. If they ain't out in real soon, 
I have it in my mind, I'm leaving you. Because you ain't ready. You knew we had somewhere to be. You know there's a war we're fighting. You know there's a job we have to do. But you're not ready. You're getting ready? You got to be, you, you got to come to church ready. That means studying your word at home. Don't come and just say, well, I'm going to get it at Bible study. No, you study your word in advance so you can be ready. Because sometimes you can walk up in here and have to face a devil. Y'all do know the devil go to church. He got membership. You don't believe me? Look at the beginning of Job. The Bible says Jesus and the, the, uh, God was in there. And they was having a little activity. And here comes the devil walking right up in that joker. Nobody stopped him. And he walking past whoever up in there. Nobody stopped him. And they got like, what you doing here? Well, I just came going to and fro. I just want to mess with somebody. And I said, well, who you want to mess with? Let me mess with Job. Why could God say, go ahead and mess with Job? Because the Bible says that Job was an upright and perfect man. He was mature. Job was ready, not getting ready. Job was ready, not getting ready. So when Job get the boils on his skin, when Job lose everything he had, Job was already ready to say, listen, whatever God give him, God take it away. But he was already ready because he had already had relationship. He knew what it was to go to the synagogue. He knew what to do when it, when it came time when he thought his kids, listen, he didn't know what his kids had done, but he knew that they did something wrong. He knew what it meant to rent his clothes. That means to tear his clothes, put ash on his face, and go before the Lord. He knew what it meant already, so when stuff happened, it wasn't new to him. He could go. Friends talking, he, nope, I'm praying. And then even in his prayer, he knew God was so good, he could say what he really meant in his heart, and the Holy Ghost would make intercession. Man, I'm mad I'm even living. And the Holy Ghost said, well, he, that ain't what he meant. What he really meant was, this is messed up, Lord. Because <laughs> you got to understand, you know, if it ain't no intercessor there, and God takes your word literally, well, you don't want to be living. Oh, go say, that ain't really what he meant. What he meant to say was, this is just one of the roughest days that I've had. The guy said, oh, I can take that. And the wife said, well, why don't you just curse God? And then you say, woman, you sound foolish. I ain't about to cuss him. What, what's wrong with you? I might be upset, but I ain't about to cuss him. Because, listen, I'm already prepared. I already know who God is. You don't, if you don't know who God is, then you don't even fit the bill to be building anybody else. You don't even fit the walk. So what you need to do is sit down and let somebody build you. Matthew. Thank you, Jesus. There's nothing wrong with sitting down and saying, I have area that I need to up in. There's nothing wrong in saying, I need a minute. And here's the thing. Nobody has the right to critique you for saying, sorry. Everybody need a bathroom break. Everybody need a time just to powder your nose, straighten out your clothes, and get yourself together. Y'all know y'all do it? Yeah. You check yourself over. You know, I left my belt at home. You know, go home and get the belt. But come back. Because the job ain't over. And matter of fact, when you come back, everybody ought to be rejoicing that you came. Not sitting up here talking about where you been. What you mean where I been? I just had to get myself together so I could do this the right way. 
God has sent us, he said, to edify. He gave the gifts of ministry to edify, to build the church. He gave the Holy Spirit to help edify and build the church, to prepare us for ministry, to make us ready disciples, and then to charge us up for the fight that's on the way. And it's coming, saints. It's coming. The devil is playing more mind games now than ever before. He's playing more mind games now than ever before. Listen, number nine, that's Matthew 20, 28. Let me see if I can get through this. We're going to finish this chapter tonight uh, in a timely manner. In a timely manner. 20 through 28. This is the mother of Zebedee's sons. This mother comes into a conversation, asks for a one-on-one conversation with Jesus. Right? I'm not going to read you the scripture. You can read. And basically said, can my two sons sit at your right and at your left hand? Now, anybody that knows anything biblically knows that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, which means that God is sitting at Jesus' left hand. You want a seat in between me and God. But either way, she comes and she says, Lord, have mercy, you want a seat between me and God. Some people, you better be careful where they sit at. Because they would try to be a spacer in between you and God. So he's sitting up. Yeah, I got to rope that in. I got to rope that in. See, some people don't want you to have a personal relationship with God. They want your relationship to have to go through them so that they can eavesdrop on your conversation. Yeah, y'all, y'all. <laughs> ah, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus is sitting there, and she says, uh, can my, I want my two sons to be at your right and your left hand. Right? Jesus looked at him and said, drink from the cup I'm going to drink from. And can you take the baptism that I'm baptized in? What was the cup that he drank from? Anybody? Nope. Anybody? What's the cup? It is the cup of sorrow and suffering. He asked them, are you willing to suffer like I'm getting ready to, and I am suffering. Then he says, can you take the baptism, which is a representation of his death. Can you take the kind of death that I'm getting ready to take? What kind of death was it? It was humiliating. It was unfitting. It wasn't right. And sometimes in the body of Christ, when it comes to who we are in our church membership, you got to understand, you are taking the death that Christ did. Because watch what he says. They, they say, yes, we can. And he says, you surely will. That's what the Bible say. Let me make sure. He, he, he said, you, you surely will. He says, and he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant these two my sons that they may sit on your right hand and on the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, said, do you not know what you ask? Are you able to drink from the cup that which I drink? And be baptized in the baptism that I'm baptized with? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those whom, for whom it is prepared by my father. Now watch this. So Jesus is rebuking them. Let me show you how silly some folks, church folks is. They see them getting rebuked. But then they, because of what they heard, because they, you know how we do, we don't pay attention to the whole story. Because in the whole story, they realize he just told them, I can't give that to you. But since they heard it, now they upset and grumbling. 
why they get to ask that, why they do this, why they do that. Next thing you know, he got to address the whole crowd. And what does he say? He basically tells them, he says, all of y'all that want to be great, let me show you how. He says, if you really want to be the greatest, then you must be willing to serve. If you want to be the greatest, then you have to be the last. One thing I loved about mom when it came to dinner and we knew the food was slim, she would sit back and let everybody else eat and then say, I'll take what's left. Now, I had to know sometimes in my mind, I was a kid, so it didn't really bother me, but now that I've gotten older, that there had to be sometimes where she went to bed hungry in order to make sure somebody else had. There had to be times when she gave up everything that she should have had in order to make sure that we did have. It wasn't that some of our parents couldn't go to college. They just couldn't afford college and you. So they had to choose you in order to make sure you had the life that they knew that you needed. And then so they said, listen, I'll do it later. That's why we got more women and more men going to college late in life now. Because they needed to provide first for the ones that they cared about. So they're sitting up and you're having this conversation. And he basically says this, if you're not willing to feed somebody else before you at your own risk, You ain't even helping. In ministry, in the church, do you care more about you or those behind you? What are we stuck on? Our traditions because they fit us? Or are we more to say, Lord, however I got to serve, let me serve. If I got to put on an apron, let me put on an apron. If I got to pick up a broom, let me pick up a broom. I don't need no title because the only title I need is servant. That's what y'all seen. I just want to hear the Lord say servant. He ain't even going to say your name according to y'all scripture, according to the way y'all say it. I believe he's going to say my name. Leon. I'm going to say yes. They're going to say, you know you jacked up that sermon. I say yes. You know you didn't do what I told you to do. Ah, uh, yes. I tried. I put forth the effort. But watch this. Don't lie to your people and tell them you put forth the effort and you did the least amount that you could. See, when you are a real disciple, when you really know that your membership is a gift from God, you'll go the extra mile just to make sure. So it's no longer somebody say, well, just call and just check me. You'll be like, yeah, I'm going to call and check on you. Next thing you know, not only did you call them, you sent a text message. Not only did you send a text message, you got on Facebook. You did whatever you had to do to make sure that the assignment was complete. See, man, I, I'm tired of folk that just want to sit up in the high seat but don't want to do the work. Y'all not listening to me. They're asking to sit at his right hand and his left hand, but they ain't did nothing. He said, listen. What you're asking me, those seats are for, watch this, because he didn't say it, what, the seats weren't there. Look what he said. He says in verse 23, but it is for those, hold up, if it was only two seats, it would have been both. But he said it is for those for whom it is prepared by the Father. God already knows. God already knows. He says, yes, you'll, you'll, you'll drink from the cup. You'll, 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 you'll uh, taste the baptism that I've been baptized with. The question is, if you never get to the high table, will you still work? If your name is never called, work. If you a preacher, will you preach to one like you will 10,000? 
If you're an usher, will you usher even if nobody else show up? If you're a musician, will you sing even when ain't nobody listening? Will you still do what God has called you to do, not because of the grandstanding, but because it is my reasonable service? Or are you only doing it for somebody to pat you on the back? Because then the Bible says you already got your reward. Yeah, well, you do it openly because you want somebody to see you. He said, whatever they give you, you already got. But when you do it privately, I'll reward you. And I'll do it openly. When God rewards you, he gives you something that other people can't even fathom. But too many times in our church membership, we only want to do the stuff that look like we're going to get some recognition. Well, he's going to call my name. Now listen, don't y'all sit there and lie. I have been in church long enough. I've had my own situations where I've done stuff, and I just knew the pastor was going to say my name, and I got happy, and then he didn't say my name, and I went home mad. How could you not say my name? I led the effort, but you fought off everybody else in the background that didn't do nothing. I stayed up late at night. I counted this. I did that. You hear what I'm saying? I, I, I. I'm going, I went home mad. And I'm sitting here, and now I'm sitting here like, but I got my reward. I wanted something more. It wasn't I really wanted his na my name to be called. I should have been seeking his face. I should have been saying, Lord, this ain't even enough. I, this just part of what I owe you. But I owe you all of it. These brothers and their mother has come and said, listen, if they're going to walk with you, give them a high seat. My kids just ain't right. Listen, I'm going to tell you all something now. Uh, when we first got here, uh, y'all know I started sitting over there. Wouldn't even take the seat from pulpit. I could care less take the seat from pulpit. I can preach from the floor. I can preach from, because listen, I've done it. It don't really make no difference. That seat, that, that's just decorum. That don't mean nothing. And how many of you know, I could give you this seat right now, but if you don't know what to do with it, you'll make a mess of it. Quit asking for seats that you're not even built for. I want to be a prophet. No, you don't. Because you can't even handle what God's showing you now. Oh, I want to be an evangelist and travel. Girl, you can't, we can't even trust you to go from here to Ben Harbor and back. Oh, I got a word, but as soon as we put you up here, I'm scared. I ain't, you ain't got no word, then sit down. Let's build you up. Where do you get built up? In the local church. You can make your mistakes and people going to love on you. So when you get to the big stage, when you get to those platforms, I'm telling you, you, you can work. I, listen, Chain Lake had me messed up. Getting ready to preach in front of all these preachers. I'm like, oh, Lord. All these preachers. And then I'm sitting there, and I'm getting excited. I realize I ain't scared. Just excited. I said, Lord, I don't want to mess up. He said, you've been preaching every Sunday. And just imagine they faces and your people faces, and you'll be just all right. And I got up there, and I delivered the word. And they were, oh, we're just so blessed. I said, he's looking at me like, okay. Because in my mind, I go back and I critique myself every time. I missed that point. Did I make that clear? And then I just get to the point after a while, I'll be like, well, to God be the glory. It got to be that way. But I had to be built up somewhere. My small beginnings, the small stages, the small places. Because when you get to the big stage, I'm telling you, that those small things become magnified. So you got to be careful. Listen, okay, let me keep moving. But let's pay attention to verse 28. Let me give you this one. It says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give. This is what should be happening in the local body as a member. You should serve and give. Get this. Serving is doing the work. Giving is going the extra mile. If 
when you give the best of your service, telling the world, y'all don't know that old song, in the morning session, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me back it up, right? Uh, if you serve, right, and you're, you're doing the work, you're doing the work, but then somebody come behind you, perfect example, I, I got to use examples, on Friday, we served the community with the food bank, right? Now, the food bank has some good apples. Layla and me like eating apples. Nia getting to the point she like apples too, right? So I had a bag of apples. We was getting ready to go home. All, everything was gone. Next thing I know, here come this lady pulling up. 930. No, eight, was it 930 or not? Close, yeah. Uh, we supposed to be done. And what she said was, she said, is it all over with? Y'all served already? She said, yes. She said, I couldn't get here because we only got one car. He has to be at work. He said, I, 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 I just couldn't get here. Now, I'm looking at everybody for first Salem. And I'm looking at my apples. Before I know, I said, here you go. You can have them. And everybody else, they bread, whatever. And they say, she said, but I don't want to take, I don't want to take from you guys. If it, I, I just missed it. I said, listen, first off, tell me what time you're going to be here next week. Because we'll set you something aside in order to make sure you have. And then take all of this stuff. We don't need it. Now, I wanted my apple. But sometimes, even after I've served, then I move to a state of giving. Because I gave everything they told us to give away. We did all of that. But now my service, my giving said, listen, you can give a little bit more. You can do a little bit better. And I'm sorry, I wish we wasn't on TV, but I'm going to say it anyway. First Salem, we could do a little bit more. We could do a little bit better. We got to have to get out of just the service part and get to the giving part when you give out of yourself he gave himself as a ransom for many he could have just stopped at preaching he said that ain't good enough I'll go to the cross for them I'll sacrifice for them when's the last time you sacrificed don't lie don't shake your head be like ooh dead that's good no stop lying when was the last time you sacrificed for somebody else and I ain't talking about your kids. I ain't talking about your family. I'm talking about for somebody you don't know, when was the last time you went extra for them? And you did it. But when you did it, you thought it was for them. But it turned out being for you. Went home, and I started looking at my house with no apple. But I began grateful for the one banana my kids had left me. That's what the local church is. Brother Frank, I think I, I can get through this last one. Number 10. Number 10. Number 11 is going to be your self-reflection. Healthy church members find blank in being last. Nope, let's look what the look what the text says. Somebody already had it. Joy. Right here, page 73, the third uh, paragraph down. It says, healthy church membership means you find joy in being last instead of seeking your way and being first. You should find joy in being last. Ooh, girl, we fed all them people. I ain't getting not one rib, but that's all right, because all them people got fed. Ooh, I, ooh, I, ooh, listen, I, ooh, I, man, we, I'm getting out of service late. Why are you getting out of late? Because I had to stay at the altar and pray with somebody. They just needed a word. I need to be there and encourage them. I, you should find some joy, and here's what joy is. 
joy is the expression of peace, happiness, and excitement. See, y'all thought I was going to give y'all something all deep. Nope. Joy is the expression of peace, happiness, and excitement in the pure context of what God is doing in others and how he has allowed you to participate. When you can get real joy, you get happy seeing other people get blessed. Ooh, you get a peace just, you know, you know you're in your own storm, but you see somebody else coming out of theirs, and they say, you know, I'm just happy for you, girl. You get some real joy out of it. It's not fake and it's not phony. Here's the thing about fake joy, it diminishes. It don't last. But real joy, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world didn't take, take it away. This peace that I have. This excitement that I have when I come into the household of faith, y'all be wondering, why you got to be so loud? Because I just get excited. Why? Because I'm in here with some people that love God. I'm here with some folk that don't mind just lifting up the name. I get excited because then I start thinking not just about y'all, but what God has done for me. And now my excitement should run off on somebody else. But it is my expression. That's why you can't get mad at somebody. They won't sit down. They won't stop hollering. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know why they're excited. And then it says it's happiness. You got too many sad folk up in the church. Why can't you be happy? I know your house don't look like you want it to look, but it's still a house. I know your kids ain't acting like you want them to act, but they ain't dead. You got to find the small things to be happy about. Because here's the thing. The devil wants to take the small things because if he takes the small, you'll never see the big. As long as he takes the small stuff, you will never see the big stuff that he does in your life because you're too busy concentrating on what ain't there. Sometimes you got to be like, no, nah. Lord, I thank you. Ooh, my basement flooded. Put the least of my water on. I mean, sometimes you have to make yourself, you, you got to make yourself see it. And it'll bring you that joy. Joy is also Jesus, others, and then you. That's the way of serving. You serve Jesus first. Then you serve others. And God will take care of you. 1 Samuel 12 and 24 says, if you're going to serve, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully. One of the worst things is your membership and you, you can't be found because you're not faithful. And according to the text, the reason you're not faithful because it's really not in your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. You ain't got to be faithful to the pastor. You got to be faithful to God based on what he has done for you. When you're faithful to God, you can be faithful to everybody else because it'll just line up with what God has already shown and did. When we focus on all that God has done for us, our service can flow from a heart of gratitude, not, feeling, not a feeling of, of obligation or duty. 1 Peter 4 and 11 says... If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides. One of the reasons that we have so many people fainting in the church, losing hope in the church, is because you try to do it under your own strength. When the Bible clearly says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. How do I get the joy of the Lord? I study his word. I meditate in his word both day and night. I spend time with God. And then he provides my strength. Because when I am weak, that is when he is strong. Sometimes the reason that things are getting to you, the reason things are happening, is because God is just trying to get your attention and tell you to turn it over. Because you're trying to do it the way you see it. Just turn it over to me. I got this. I got this. 
in our church membership, we have to remember that God has this. All you do is do your part. Fulfill your responsibility. Be faithful in what God has called you to and quit letting everybody else do your work and you get the gratification. Feel like telling some folk for the years out, some folk won't have to be moved. Because I just keep hearing they got to be faithful in the small stuff. They got to be not only committed, but they got to be accountable. But then I also hear God saying, Timing is everything. Timing is everything. He said, let the wheat and the tear grow together, and I will separate. Timing is everything. But guess what? Can you be found faithful that when it is time to cut down the weeds out of the garden, that you don't get mistaken? That you not get mistaken and get cut down in the process. Anybody got questions on tonight? Any questions on tonight? Any questions on tonight? On tonight, we have gone through and completed our time in the book, I Am a Church Member. I'm going to ask you to do one thing by Sunday. I want you to write down three areas in which you need help in in your growth, in your edification process, that you can be built up, that you can be prepared. On Sunday, we will have a basket, and I'm just going to ask you to drop it in the basket. During the month of August, the pastor is going on a three-day fast. Might be extended out. I'm asking all leaders to join. And I know that some people can do the Daniels, some people can do the water, some people can just go from certain times because of medication, medication, different things of that sort. I'm asking you to join in. We will release that information for three days. We're going to Wednesday, Thursday, and a Friday. For those three days, we want to fast and seek God's face. Because we're living in the last days. We're living in some terrible times. And the closer that we, more that we walk through this, what God started to show me was that the church has to be ready. And we have to be together. There's no superheroes in here. I'm not a superhero. I don't have a cape. I don't have any supernatural power only thing I can give you is Jesus and pray that we do it together amen grab hands with somebody and just look at them and just say that one word together dear gracious God we thank you because through it all, you have been there. God, but I thank you for these, my brothers and my sisters, because we are together. Where I'm weak, somebody else is strong. Where I'm down, somebody else is up. But even as we touch on 